come on in folks. Scooch to the center so we can have those empty seats, thanks. My name is Rebecca Deschweinitz and I'm an Associate Professor of History and an Executive Committee member of the Women's Studies Program here at Brigham Young University and on behalf of the Department of History and BYU Women's Studies and the Maxwell Institute, I am so pleased to welcome you here tonight um, to our evening with uh, Professor Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Um, she'll be talking about her new research that we're all excited about. Um, uh, I have uh, just a few announcements. Uh, you may or may not know that March is Women's History Month, and this is one of a number of events that we have going on here on campus to celebrate and illuminate uh, women's history. We hope that you will join us or consider joining us for some of the events that we have still yet to come. Uh, next Wednesday, March 22nd at 5 p.m. in the Education in Zion Auditorium, which is in the basement of the JFSB, we will have a faculty panel discussion. Um, we have four faculty members who will be talking about four of the amazing uh, 20 trailblazing Mormon women that are featured in an exhibit that's part of the Education in Zion temporary exhibit area going on um, this month. So please join us for a conversation about some other remarkable uh, Mormon women trailblazers. And I, I believe that one of those uh, trailblazing women will actually be in attendance, so you won't want to miss. On Friday, March 24th at noon in B92 of the JFSB, we will have um, Professor Francesca Morgan from Northwestern University speaking to us as part of the colloquium series and also as part of our events associated with Women's History Month. She'll be talking about the chatty old lady adventures in genealogy. So it should be fun. Uh, all month long, there's also uh, an exhibit in Special Collections that features um, elements of Mormon women's history, so we hope that you'll check that out. And International Cinema has a really fantastic lineup uh, for their women's history series all month long, so also please check their schedule and join us for one of those um, films. Now, uh, before I formally introduce our, our guest, and get really going for the evening. Um, we will begin, as is our custom here at BYU, with a prayer uh, that will be given by Elsie Pauley Rackham. Uh, Elsie, who served a mission in the England-Birmingham mission and is currently is taking a Mormon women's uh, history class, uh, is a communications major, double ma minoring in political science and women's studies. Elsie. Father in heaven, we thank thee for this wonderful opportunity to um, learn at the feet of Dr. Ulrich tonight. We're grateful that she has a place here to, to teach us, um, even if it is just for this one night. We pray that the Spirit will be with us to inspire us and to um, see relationships beyond what is being taught, that we can apply the principles of influential women into our lives and that we can also do something extraordinary. We love thee and we thank thee for the blessing of this university and for opportunities to expand our, our knowledge and that we can go forth into the world and, and make an impact. We love thee and we, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hey, um, I'll also make a little plug for our BYU Department of History Facebook page. Um, as part of Women's History Month, we're featuring um, something every day or every work day about women in history. And today's post actually features our guest uh, for tonight. Um, but it's a really fun thing we've been doing all month, so, um, so check that out as well. All right, uh, Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Um, is in the history department at Harvard University where she is the 300th anniversary university professor. Uh, she is the author most recently of A House Full of Females, uh, Plural Marriage and Women's Rights in Early Mormonism, 1835 to 1870. Um, this is why you're here tonight. You're eager to, to, to learn about her research for this book. Um, she has uh, a number of other uh, books and edited volumes. Uh, I'll share some of those titles. Tangible Things, Writing History Through Objects, Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History. Uh, you knew it was a bumper sticker. Did you know that she coined the phrase and then wrote a book about it? <laughs> uh, the Age of Homespun, Objects and Stories in the Creation of an American Myth. Uh, Good Wives, Image and Reality in the Lives of Women in Northern New England. 
Uh, and she's most famous, of course, for her book, A Midwife's Tale, The Life of Martha, ba Martha Ballard, based on her diary. Uh, for this book, uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize for History, and it was the first work of women's history to earn that award. So really uh, pathbreaking and a remarkable book on a number of counts. It also won the Bancroft Prize in American History, the Dunning Prize, the Joan Kelly Memorial Prize, the Berkshire Conference of Women's Historians Book Prize, and another half dozen awards. It really is that good. So if you haven't read it, read A House Full of Females first, uh, and then go back to A Midwife's Tale. Um, you'll love it, and then you'll want to go through the whole rest of the list, right? On a personal note, I will add that A Midwife's Tale both pushed me to study American women's history in graduate school, and I know I'm not the only one who was so influenced by this, um, and it helped me actually get into graduate school in the first place. In my admissions essay, I wrote something about encountering this book and what it taught me, and wove in a little bit about some research I was currently doing on Rappahannock County, Virginia public nurses. Uh, one of the people on the admissions committee was the late colonial American historian Stephen Innes, uh, who greatly admired uh, Laurel, and I think he had hopes that another unassuming Mormon woman from the western frontier might go on to do some surprising things. So um, no Pulitzer here yet, and don't hold your breath. Um, but I really benefited uh, in my own thinking, as well as from some others' perspectives, um, based on conversations I had with him, as well as with others at the University of Virginia and others I've met along my academic path, um, by the idea that a woman from a peculiar religious tradition could really get and was perhaps especially well suited to understanding historical complexities, to being able to work around and with and to do justice to the tensions that people, especially religious people of the past, lived with. Uh, perhaps women of faith, or at least women of faith like Professor Ulrich, are also just unendingly patient and hopeful, willing to work methodically and painstakingly, and able to see significance, even beauty and grace, where others see something else or nothing at all. So those are the books, list of books. Uh, she has dozens of articles, book chapters, and personal essays as well, including some that my students love from the Pink Dialogue and from Exponent 2, and they just discovered that um, some of her early publications were for the Release Society magazine in the 1960s, so I think they ran out of class and went and looked them up. <laughs> and we'll be talking about them next week, probably. Um, in all of her work, she imbues the seemingly mundane with meaning. She brings nuance to things we think don't matter, such as a diary with laconic entries, or to things we already knew mattered, but never fully understood why. Her scholarship has been paradigm shifting. She's opened up the world of early American women, transcended old narratives, and forced us to examine the past from the perspective of the ordinary people who lived it. More than that, it has encouraged many of us to personally rethink our own lives, to imagine new possibilities, and to appreciate the dailiness, the insignificant significance of what we do. Her engaging, witty prose brings the past magically to life and makes even those of us who aren't nerds, or so I've been told, um, love history. How often does a historian uh, write something that becomes a popular bumper sticker slogan, right? Uh, Dr. Ulrich has also been involved in a number of public history projects. She's curated and consulted on exhibits, been involved with films, um, has a really great Harvard X Online course on material cultural history that you all can take, and maybe they'll see a surge in enrollments on that. Um, the list goes on. So does her list of honors and awards, and I've mentioned a few of the book prizes, and I'll mention a few other honors just to give you a little more of a sense of her remarkable uh, contributions to the profession. She's been awarded Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellowships. She's been the recipient of an Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Award, a John F. Kennedy Award. She's been a fellow for the American Philosophical Society. She's won teaching and mentoring awards and is renowned for her ambitious and original courses and her tender yet sharp counsel to students, as well as her quilt making for their new babies. Uh, Professor Ulrich has held some sort of endowed chair at Harvard. Um, she's had a couple of different ones for 22 years and is the past president of the American Historical Association as well as of the Mormon History Association. A descendant of Mormon pioneers, her connection to the Mormon faith goes back generations on both sides. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich grew up in rural Idaho on the road to Yellowstone with the Teton Mountains on the horizon and potatoes in the dirt all around. 
Her first publication was for Seventeen Magazine. I would guess she'd be writing for Teen Vogue if she was growing up now. Uh, <laughs> she gave the commencement address at her University of Utah graduation in 1960, sharing a few ideas that might have been included in Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique that came out three years later and which she discovered in church, whispering among the sisters. Uh, in 1960, she and her husband headed to Boston so he could get a PhD in engineering at MIT. That's what women, especially good Mormon women, did, right? Uh, if Laurel originally imagined she might be trading her Phi Beta Kappa pin for diaper pins, uh, historical forces and personal circumstances, as she explained to my, some of my students this afternoon, among other things, intervened. Uh, and while having and raising five kids, she did a lot of writing, editing and publishing, earned an MA in English at Simmons College in 71, a PhD in history at the University of New Hampshire in 1980, and helped give birth and voice to modern Mormon feminism in between. We are lucky that she has come back to her roots as she nears the end of her illustrious career and turned her attention and considerable skill and talent as a historian and writer to helping us understand and reimagine early Mormon women. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Thank you. Uh, makes me realize what a long life I've had when you think about that. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm happy to be here with my sister, Lael Erickson, who is a BYU graduate of 1962, two? Um, with my granddaughter, uh, Lena Chu, who is, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Lena Chu Perkins, who is a BYU graduate of 2000. 15, and my granddaughter, Julia Chu, who will soon graduate, right, Julia? Um, so I feel I'm an honorary um, member of the BYU committee, uh, community, even though I'm a graduate of the University of Utah. So um, I've just published a book, my first and only book-length study of early Mormonism. As you've heard, I've been writing about a lot of other things over a great many years. But it was a, a great joy and a great challenge to come back to my own roots and to revisit a period in history that had been transformative in my life ever since Susan Kohler, who is also in the audience, discovered a copy of the Woman's Exponent in the Harvard Library in the early 1970s. And I, uh, I was inspired by those early Mormon women to expand my horizons a bit and to believe that I could be a woman of faith and a, and a woman of activism and scholarship as well. So it was a little bit daunting then to go back and turn my historical lens on what had been heroines from the past and, and really try to look at these stories in a scholarly way. The book is a complex book. It's a long book, as a number of people have reminded me. It's a book about a great many things. But what I'm going to do tonight is share with you one of the themes, one of several themes in the book. Um, a difficult theme. It was difficult for me. And I suspect it will be difficult for some of you. Although on the other hand, it builds on a very long scholarship going back to the 1970s, works by Linda Newell, by Maureen Beecher, by um, Jill Durr, by Carol Cornwall Madsen, by Levina Fielding, by others, 
um, in a more contemporary way by the fabulous new first 50 years of Relief Society. So those of you who've kept up with Mormon history over these many years will recognize that other people have prepared the ground for the story that I'm going to tell you this evening. The title of my talk, Huddling Together, Rethinking the Position of Women in Early Mormonism, 16, 1835 to 1870. And it's my rethinking. It's not what I'm arguing should be your rethinking. How I was rethinking as I went through this return to a history that had been a bit mythologized, I think, um, by my generation and had been inspiring to us. Think about the word huddling. What do you think about when you think of a huddle? Um, maybe a football game. Um, a competitive contest in which the leaders of one group will group in a kind of secret huddle to plot strategy. Or maybe you think of the word huddle as um, something very, very sad, like uh, contemporary refugees um, taking shelter in a makeshift tents, huddling together for warmth to try to survive. So you can imagine it as a, a very um, affirming, powerful act of unity or a, a kind of desperate act of hanging together in difficult circumstances. I'm not going to start with the quotation that from which I took this title. I'm going to move gradually toward that. But I wanted to alert you to these possibilities and these possible themes. What I would like to begin with is the um, cover of my book has a, a beautiful painting on it. And I was so lucky at the very end of the process to discover at the Springville Art Museum a wonderful little genre painting by the Danish, famous Danish, Danish Mormon painter, painter C.C.A. Christensen. It um, was painted, it's not well known. I think this may be its first publication. I'm not positive about that. It was painted as a gift to his former missionary companion and friend, John uh, Ferdinand Frederick Dorius. And, then, and so I can enlarge it here, and I hope that you'll be able to see some of the details in this painting. It's called Weighing the Baby. And to me, it perfectly represented a house full of females. The women are gathered in a home, a humble home, in Ephraim, Utah, shortly after the birth of a baby. The newly delivered mother lies in clean white sheets under a homemade quilt. Two women in the center of the picture weigh the baby with an old-fashioned balance scale, while an old woman, who you may not be able to see way in the back, is smoking a pipe. She has a pipe in her hand. She is looking on. A fifth woman rocks a somewhat older baby, while two toddlers, one in the center of the picture reaching up to the baby, and one at the door reaching up to the father, vie for attention. Now, despite the pipe-smoking woman, this is indeed a Mormon painting. The artist is well known for his paintings of the Overland Trail, the large murals that are at the BYU Art Museum. The woman in the bright yellow dress at the center of the picture may be John Durius's first wife, Kaya or Caroline Franson, and the woman in the bed is probably his plural wife, Gunhild Torgerson. But there is no way you could know that if you hadn't gone to family search and done a little bit of genealogical research. 
because this is really a generic picture of a community of women doing womanly things. With slight changes of clothing, this could be a scene from the diary of Martha Moore Ballard in 18th century Maine because childbirth was managed by women, by neighbors, relatives, friends coming in to assist the midwife. It could also be a gathering portrayed on a lacquered mirror from 19th century Persia that my students and I examined at the Harvard Art Museum last week. With or without plural marriage, childbirth had long been a matter for women. It was a center, a core of women's culture. And the arrangement of figures in Christensen's painting marks a kind of boundary between the worlds of women and the worlds of men. If you look closely, the father has a whip in his hand, not to whip his family, <laughs> but because I think the artist is suggesting he's whipped his horse in his effort to get there in order to greet his child. But he cannot come into the room until the women give him permission until their work is complete. This is his child. It will bear his name, but at this moment, he must defer to the authority of women. The door is open, but he is neither fully outside or in. The women are not exactly huddling together, they are together, and if we look back from time immemorial to documents and scenes and histories about assemblies of women in the private space of whatever it is women do, you will discover that these images have carried both powerfully positive spiritual connotations and also elements of danger and threat. So, the artist who designed the cover of my book did not know when she chose to frame the painting in the book cover with some calligraphy by Wilford Woodruff taken from his diary, something that I use in the book that Wilford Woodruff created this border describing the baptism of his parents in 1838 while he was sitting in a house in Scarborough, Maine, waiting for the birth of his first child. Framed with Wilford's diary at the end becomes a fascinating emblem, at least for me, because I know where it came from of the world of men and the worlds of women in early Mormonism. Wilford, the missionary, out baptizing. This is about a birth and a rebirth, and it's about men and women in an American society. So, where can we go with this image? What can we learn? by looking at other documents, by looking at diaries and other records, what was the boundary between the worlds of women and the worlds of men? Or was there a boundary? So the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as you all know, was formally organized on April 6, 1830. Maybe you didn't know. It was formally organized in a 20 by 30 foot log dwelling that supposedly, according to some of the recent research, contains 60 people. We hear about the six men who officially incorporated the church, but this Peter Whitmer house was a house full of women, those early female members who believed in the restoration. And a revelation addressed to Emma Smith a few weeks later made very, very clear 
that the, those who accepted the new gospel, the new teaching, are sons and daughters of my kingdom. This was going to be a place in this house, this house of God, for men and for women together to form something. As you know, the Revelation called Emma an elect lady, and it promised her that her husband would ordain her to expound scriptures, exhort the church, according as that shall be given to her by the Spirit. And early diaries, I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but early diaries absolutely affirmed that women spoke in the earliest Mormon gatherings. They gave testimony that were part of these meetings which were held almost uniform, uniformly in homes. In early Kirkland, Ohio, other events took place in private homes under the joint leadership of men and women. Elizabeth Whitney appears to have perfected the gift of tongues. Even into old age, she could sing in glossolalia. She and her husband, according to Wilford Woodruff's diary, frequently hosted what they called feasts for the poor. May sound a bit familiar, where people came having fasted for two meals and then met to pray and testify before distributing surplus food from the feast to the needy. Such events took on a more formal quality when they moved into the newly constructed temple at Kirtland. And I was fascinated as I looked at this particular image because I hadn't really thought about it. But the Kirtland temple has two doors. Um, and in early New England meeting houses, there were two doors, one for men and one for women. And I'm not positive that that's how they were used in Kirtland. But what we do know in Kirtland, that there was a differentiation of the place of men and women, some men and women, in the church and in the sanctuary in the Kirtland Temple, which had these amazing ascending pulpits with the mysterious initials on them that emphasized a hierarchy of male authority, but also a kind of breadth of this authority being spread through the male community. And Phoebe Carter, who came to Kirtland um, and there met Wilford Woodruff, who she married um, at, in Kirtland, um, was thrilled to be promised by Joseph Smith Sr., the prophet's father, in a blessing that he gave her, that she would be able to sew the veil of the temple. I think he was talking about these amazing retractable curtains that were used in the Kirtland Temple. But let's think about it in terms of boundaries now. In March 23, 1837, Wilford Woodruff arrived at the temple early and retired to a veiled air area in the pulpit area where the elders assembled for prayer. And then as the crowd gathered, he emerged into the main space where at the invitation of the prophet's father, he read a passage from the Book of Mormon while the congregation all stood. Then the curtains dropped, dividing the room into four parts. The females occupied two parts and the males the other, Wilford wrote. Male leaders presided in each of the four divisions as people engaged in, Wilford's words, singing, exhortation, and prayer. Some had a tongue others an interpretation, and all was in order. The reference to order was important because when Joseph Smith first arrived in Kirtland, he worried about the enthusiastic religion, and it was important to bring this into some kind of order. They were a bit worried about too much enthusiasm would get out of hand. And yet, this system encouraged both participation and some kind of break on things getting out of hand because uh, this, the community had grown. They'd outgrown a 20 by 30 feet log house. They're now in the meeting house and each group 
uh, was able, with um, the, the veils down, to be able to speak in what may have been a much more comfortable setting now that the group has expanded so in such a large way. And then after that initial um, form of worship, the curtains came up again, and they're all together in the same room. As Wilford wrote, brought the whole congregation in full view of each other. And while the presence of the Lord filled the house, the congregation of the saints fell upon their knees, and as one man, and I'm hoping he meant one woman, vocally poured forth rejoicing, supplication, and prayer before the God of Israel, which closed the services of the day after they contributed to the support of the poor. So we had a domestic feast for the poor, and then we had something much more elaborate taking place in the newly constructed Kirtland Temple. Now let's move ahead, and we're going to skip, uh, for purposes of this talk, all the struggles at Kirtland in Missouri and elsewhere, and we're now in Nauvoo, and we're here with an early painting. We're now growing 10 to 12,000 people in this Latter-day Saint community. And this is Robert Campbell painting of General Joseph Smith addressing the Nauvoo Legion. Converts had poured in from other parts of the United States and Great Britain. Stores and shops had multiplied. Men had organized a Masonic society and they paraded in a militia they called the Nauvoo Legion, while women flocked to meetings of a newly established female relief society with Emma Smith as its president. So a different kind of demarcation now, as we come into Nauvoo, it's getting bigger and bigger, and you all know the story, and I do not need to repeat it, but just remind you that the Nauvoo Relief Society began as an individual initiative, a group initiative, in a community of women. It began with Sarah Kimball and her, uh, her, her friend, uh, um, and then expanded to more neighbors coming in and saying, we, we should build a sewing society um, and we can be able to contribute to the construction of a temple. There is now no meeting place. Uh, they've lost the Kirtland Temple. They were never able to build a meeting place in Missouri. They're now in Nauvoo. They probably want to get out of the weather. They're still having outdoor meetings and local, short, cottage meetings where the old patterns persist. They're speaking in tongues. They're singing in tongues. There are testimonies. There are uh, individual expressions from men and women in these small groups, but they do not have now an orderly, expansive, a grand meeting house to meet in. And women as well as men want to contribute, a, contribute to its construction. So we know the story, right? We know this story. Joseph Smith, when Eliza Snow offers uh, her draft of a constitution for the new sewing society, there are hundreds and thousands of similar religious communities all over the U.S. attached to Congregational or Presbyterian or Church of Christ or other kinds of groups where women abolitionist societies, women's versions, women's abolitionist societies operating alongside men's and so forth. They're doing something very normal for the period to create something for women sort of parallel to what the men are doing. But in the upper room in the red brick store, Joseph Smith says he wants to give them something more, something better. And I feel like I'm talking to people who already know all this, but I'm going to remind you of it anyway with a little text. What did Joseph Smith promise? He promised to make of the society a kingdom of priests as an Enix day. He spoke of keys, a term all the way through the doctrine and covenants associated with authority with priesthood. 
He proposed a structure for the society parallel to that of male quorums. The sisters are to organize a presidency and they are to operate in the society as the president of the church does. He urged the sisters to place their confidence in their leaders, including their new president, Emma Smith. So, how has this changed? As we think back to the earlier um, boundary in the household, the world of women in household production, in childbirth, in care of the sick, um, things that are women and things are, that are men, do we have now a replication in an interesting way of um, that kind of boundary? Well, sort of. They're talking about uplifting the morals of the community, sort of women's work. They're talking about care of the poor and charity, women's charitable work, things that are often associated with the community of women. But they're also talking about something really kind of fascinating. They're talking about offices. They're talking about authority. They are talking about keys. And it was very exhilarating for the women of Nauvoo, and particularly for Eliza Snow, who was keeping the meetings. Now, you know this. Again, I'm reviewing things you know. I hope I'm giving you some way to think about them in a fresh way. If not, great, we're all on one page. Within two years, the society had more than 1,300 members. They wanted this. They needed this. They had been through a nightmare of trying to establish Nauvoo in what was essentially a disease-ridden malarial camp. Phoebe Carter had endured anything, unspeakable suffering, while her husband was in England preaching. And there was no mechanism to really ensure that the poor were taken care of, in part because everyone was poor and half of them were sick. So as new converts start to come into Nauvoo, this becomes an opportunity now for women to exercise office to have designate authority in the church in an area of ultimate significance because this is a godly community in which everyone has a place and everyone is going to partake of a feast of fat things. This is not a feast in a little house to hand out the leavings. This is a reorganization of society around communal principles and women are central to making that happen. Notice, and I found this fascinating when I was looking for slides, what Emma has in her hand. Yeah, she's got a riding crop, a whip, <laughs> which was what John Dorius had in his hand in the first painting. It's a very interesting thing, and Joseph has a sword. They're kind of symbols of authority and mastery. So Joseph in his novel Legion interview, and this actually is probably portraying an event that occurred in Nauvoo of a parade of the Nauvoo Legion in all its splendor and the parade of the women on horseback mounted alongside them. But we know rumors, contradictions, and denials about plural marriage soon roiled the new organization. And in response, Joseph and four other leading brethren sent the New Relief Society an epistle, they called it, warning that if any man attempted to teach them things, quote, contrary to the old established morals and virtues and scriptural laws, 
They should dismiss those men as liars and base imposters, whether they are prophets, seers, or revelators, patriarchs, 12 apostles, elders, priests, mayors, generals, city councilmen, prate, aldermen, marshals, police, lord mayors, or the devil. <laughs> So women are responsible for the morals of the community and they say, don't be obey that kind of authority. Their target was obviously John C. Bennett and some of his associates, who Joseph Smith denounced from the pulpit as teaching contrary principles. And of course you know that John C. Bennett retaliated by claiming it was Joe Smith himself who was the libertine. And Bartrain, and this was a big mistake, he portrayed the female Relief Society as Holy Joe's harem, that the job was to find women to serve us Joseph. Emma was outraged with other members of the society including some who had by this time been sealed to Joseph Smith. She rose to the church's defense, a strategy that was surprisingly successful. As I reviewed this material, it was on the edge in the summer of 1842. The church rallied and they really pushed back. But by the summer of 1843, Emma was distraught over her husband's apparent ceilings to Emily and Eliza Partridge, two young women who lived in her house. She threatened divorce and when Joseph gave her a copy of a revelation claiming divine permission to espouse other women, she burned it. He kept a copy. He kind of knew what was going to happen. <laughs> but what's interesting is by the autumn, the argument seemed to be settled. And as Joseph told William Clayton, his clerk, Emma was. <clears throat> all happy again. And it seems to have some, had something to do with the creation of something called the Anointed Quorum. Which was <clears throat> a quorum of men and women, the first quorum in the church, to contain both males and females who were being initiated into the temple rituals that would later be given to others in the endowment. So they were being trained to become temple workers at such time the temple was complete. What's really important and sometimes overlooked about this in my view is that only first wives, legal wives, were in the anointed quorum. And that may have been during Joseph's lifetime. And that may have been um, for many reasons, but one of them may have been a um, condition that Emma would participate because she was essential in giving ordinances to the other women um, and needed to be there. But this reconciliation came way too late. So it's fascinating that some of the first evidence of conflict um, outside the Smith household was um, between Emma and Hiram Smith. And uh, Emma was president of the Relief Society, and the Relief Society had been organized, as you know, to support the work of the temple. Um, but when a slander suit was uh, filed in the Nauvoo court, 
against a man who had claimed that, there, that women in Nova, Nauvoo were promiscuous. Emma saw an opportunity. And for two successive weeks in March, she held morning and afternoon sessions of the Relief Society, fully, fully living up to her calling to exhort the church. She reminded the society that one of their responsibilities was to correct the morals and strengthen the virtues of the community, claiming if there ever was any authority on the earth, she had it. Rereading the letter that Joseph and the four brethren had sent to the society two years before about upholding moral law, she asked for a reformation in both men and women. Now, it's really important to pause and think about the timeline and the significance of these individual events. I think we're all vaguely aware of what happened, but it's really important to think about the timing. When the Relief Society rose to the defense of the church in July of 1842, there were only two male polygamists in Nauvoo. Joseph, who had been sealed to perhaps a dozen women at that point, and Brigham Young, who had only recently acquired his first plural wife. Did you know that? It's barely begun. This was Joseph. And, and I like Kathleen Dane's point about Nauvoo being proto-polygamy. We don't really know what these relationships were like. We're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. They were called later when there were testimony from the women in the 1860s. They said they were married or sealed. There was no cohabitation that we know of. They were not publicly announced. It's really hard to know what they were. They were plural ceilings, no question. And they upset Emma. We know that. But initially, but that was in 1843. In 1842, it was pretty small. But 18 months later, on the eve of Joseph's death, 20 men and as many as 76 women, including first wives, were involved in some way. In a city with a population of over 10,000, that's a pretty small number, but it included Hiram. Very important. He had been slow to adopt this. He had asked Joseph to give that revelation, thinking it would convince Emma. And it didn't, and it's very interesting. It convinced Hiram, and he had been sealed in plural relationships, beginning with his wife's sister, um, Mary Fielding. Mercy and Mary Fielding both be, Mercy and Mary both being sealed to Hiram. Don't know if I have a picture of, yeah, here's Mary. Um, Hiram's first wife had died. He had married Mary Fielding, and then he was sealed to Mary's sister, Mercy. And this becomes important because a um, very strange um, event occurred in April um, Conference of 1843 when Hiram Smith um, announced uh, their creation of a new fund to raise money for the temple. And this was to be women contribute a penny a week to buy glass for the temple. And he made the point, the Relief Society has nothing to do with this. I am the man who's in charge of this. It was sort of an open admission of already, at this point, a real tension between Hiram and Emma, and presumably between Hiram, Mary, and Mercy, who managed this penny fund, and Emma. Hiram had embraced plural marriage. Emma had rejected it. 
it's hard not to see a correlation there. As you know, events intervened. Dissenters within the church established a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor, charging Joseph with polygamy and other offenses. And when the city council destroyed the press, Joseph and Hiram were carried to the county seat at Carthage, where, as you know, they were murdered by masked vigilantes on June 22, 1844. Two rather fascinating, dramatic things happened, uh, but quietly. We sort of haven't teased this story out. The penny fund expanded, went all the way to England. Uh, saints from all over contributed to the construction of the temple. Brigham Young accelerated the uh, completion of the temple. He did something else. He brought plural wives into the anointed quorum, and polygamy flourished. What happened to Emma and Relief Society? Brigham Young and Emma were very much at odds over the settlement of Joseph's estate. It was an extremely tense time. And we don't have much of a context, or we have plenty of context. We don't have much of a detailed story about their interactions. But what we do have, and this is published in the new first 50 years of Relief Society, Brigham Young to the 70s, Quorum. When I want the sisters or wives or the members of the church to get up Relief Society, I will summon them to my aid. But until that time, let them stay at home. And if you see females huddling together, veto the concern. And if they say Joseph started it, tell them it is a damned lie, for I know he never encouraged it. As far as I know, Brigham never attended a meeting of the Female Relief Society. He's you know, speaking to the 70s. I don't know if any of them at that meeting had attended any of the meetings. There were a handful of men who did attend these meetings. But he's had enough of females huddling together. And they are huddling because they're devastated at the death and murder of Joseph and Hiram, and we don't know what was going on, who they were, or what they were trying to do, but he didn't like it. And to the high priest quorum, it's even worse. When men get desperate, they say terrible things that they may regret, and <laughs> what are relief societies for? To relieve us of our best men. They relieved us of Joseph and Hiram. That is what they will lead to. There is no woman on the face of the earth that can save herself, but if she ever comes into the celestial kingdom, she must be led by some man. God knew what Eve was. He was acquainted with women thousands and millions of years before. amazing photograph of Emma Smith with her son David Hiram who was born I think four months after her husband's murder. Between 1828 and 1844 Emma had given birth to nine children five of whom had died in infancy. She also lost one of the twins she adopted when her own twins died. All this photograph is less flattering than her portraits. I think it never less portrays both her strength and her suffering. My eye is immediately drawn to her hands. She was quite an elegant woman, tall and straight and good looking. Look at those hands. Those are working women's hands. 
they have been in wash tubs and they've been in dirt and they have been trying to hold a family together. And I think one of the things I say as I talk about the conflict with Emma, it seems really clear to me as I read the very limited sources we have, but rather rich sources, most of which come from William Clayton's diary. She's really worried. I, we have no way of knowing what Emma Smith thought about plural marriage. There are some people who assume all of this was secret and was kept from her. Emma and Emily Partridge both say she approved of his sealing to the two of them and then later disapproved. Um, we really, it's really almost impossible to know for sure. But what I think is very, very clear from her behavior, first in her rallying the Relief Society in defense of the church at the time of the John C. Bennett affair, is she cared about the church and she cared about the survival of the church. But it's also very clear, she was terrified that Joseph's behavior, whatever it was, if it was adultery, she was terrified, but if it was some kind of revelatory vision of a new kind of family relationship, whatever it was, the world beyond is not going to know it. And things are going to come tumbling down. She wonders what will happen. Something happens to Joseph, and she is left without support for her family. So he signs over lots in Nauvoo. He signs over the, the church steamship to Emma. She was a practical woman. She kept this operation afloat for a very long time. And so, you know, I look at this picture and it's really kind of hard to fathom it. And it's very, very sad that we know so little, really, about her inner life in this period and what issues she was thinking about. Then there's Eliza Snow, a dear friend of Emma. There's a deep rift that develops between Eliza and Emma in the same period, exactly the same period. Um, what had she risked? Very respectable woman, single, in her late 30s. And she had agreed to the ceiling with Joseph Smith. And where is she left after that? Well, I think, as you know, most of the wives of Joseph Smith, the plural wives of Joseph Smith, were incorporated into the families of other church leaders. And Eliza Snow and many others were eventually became sealed for time. She belonged to Joseph for eternity, but sealed for time to Brigham Young. I am absolutely fascinated with Eliza Snow and her relationship with Brigham Young. And there's this intriguing document um, surviving in the church historical department in the Brigham Young papers. Uh, she created, um, this is before her sealing to Brigham, but it's the, um, it honors Brigham Young sealing in the, in the Nauvoo Temple to Mary Ann, his legal wife. And Eliza made this beautiful little paper emblem to honor that sealing, using a technique common in making 19th century Valentines. She cut two hearts and overlapped them to create you know, the overlapping of two hearts. And then she cut out of paper an arrow, which in her writing and Woodruff's writing and everybody's writing represented death, the arrow coming to end your life. She interwove a paper arrow and a paper key into the center to create a kind of love knot. And then she wrote this little verse. President Brigham Young and his lady, Presidentess Mary Ann Young. In 
interesting. Present and Presidentus. These parallel titles. Upon the altar of the Lord within his holy house, their covenants were sealed, and there they plighted mutual vows. She hadn't yet figured out a way to uh, talk about plural sealings. I mean, this looks very much like an egalitarian monogamous sealing, but the point is the mutuality, the parallelism. Something happening in this temple ritual that somehow made them equal a president and a presidentess. And she was a very, very wise woman, a diplomat, no question about Eliza. She was honoring the woman who would become the presiding female in the household she was about to enter herself. So she honored Marianne as the presidentess, not just in relation to President Young, but in relation to this new plural household that was being formed. Okay, so we are in a dramatic moment of crisis. We are familiar with the notion that the death of Joseph Smith created a division in the church and a contest for authority. Who is going to lead the church after Joseph? And that Brigham Young rose, you know, we know all the stories about the meetings held in Nauvoo and Sigdi Rignan coming in and challenging and Brigham succeeding and becoming the successor to Joseph Smith. And we know that defectors, men who had been very close to Joseph Smith, who left the church at the time because they could not uh, stomach polygamy and they could not stomach what they thought was an emerging hierarchical <coughs> order in the church. But what I don't think we ever talk about in the church. In fact, we're so nice. We have a, it's impossible because we want to love Emma, right? All those films about the love between Emma and Joseph. It's really hard for Latter-day Saints to face the fact that there, the choice of Brigham Young, the choice to follow the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, to leave Nauvoo and to go west, was also a rift in the community of women. Now, according to some research, about 15% of those 1,300 members of the female relief side stayed behind and never went west. But what's amazing is that the remainder of those that haven't been able to track the research, hasn't been able to track all 1,300 members, but of the research of those who can be tracked, 15% stayed behind and the rest went west. It was really an embracing of Brigham Young. Many of those women knew nothing about polygamy, but a lot of them knew about polygamy by the time they went west because in the Nauvoo temple there were massive sealings in plurality. People flocking around to be sealed in the temple before they went who, knows, who knew where. They did not know when they would ever have that opportunity again. It was a choice to stay with Brigham. It was also, in a very interesting way, a choice for plurality. And what seemed clear to me in my reading of the letters and the diaries and limited sources is they had not a clue what they were getting into. They had never seen a plural household in operation. This was done in a kind of faith, in an idea. And then they're out there in the mud of Iowa and out there in the early sagebrush of Utah, and they got to make this thing work. And how on earth are they going to do it? So I'm going to close just with an image of a log cabin. I don't know how authentic this is. It probably was used as a, an outbuilding. 
at some point, but it was a, a cabin that was in the, in the fort in Salt Lake uh, in the very first year uh, in the fort. And most of us don't know that when Brigham Young led the first company to Salt Lake and said, this is the place and we're going to stay here, um, he turned around with most of those men and went back to winter quarters. And on the way back, he met the first really big company of Latter-day Saints who spent the first winter in the valley. And more than half of that company were women. And I was so moved by the accounts in the diaries of the women in the Overland Trek, the diaries from winter quarters, and the diaries from the first winter in the Salt Lake Valley. Because women were huddling together. I have been to meeting five times this week female meetings, Patty Sessions wrote on November 27, 1847. She and Eliza participated in gatherings of women on average every other day through October and November, and then almost daily in December. It was easy to do. Packed into the area around the <coughs> fort, women who had known each other in winter quarters or on the trail were in constant contact. In contrast, Men were often away on exploring or surveying expeditions or in the canyons cutting timber. And as the women's meetings became more regular, both Eliza and Patty displayed a striking concern about who did or did not preside. At one meeting, Judith Higby presided, her husband having given her permission to do so in his absence. Eliza was meticulous in acknowledging protocol, although it's really hard to tease out what rules she was following. But it seemed to have something about control of space, control of the cabin. Whose cabin was it? And if the men were not there, it was the women's cabin. But here's an intriguing example. When Henrietta Whitney came to her cabin, Eliza told her it was her privilege to set the pattern in the order of our meetings in honor of the household to which she belongs. Henrietta, a 25-year-old widow, had been sealed in the Nauvoo Temple to Bishop Newell K. Whitney, who was still at winter quarters. In Eliza terms, it wasn't just Henrietta's marriage that gave her the privilege of presiding, but her membership in the household. And that household included the bishop's first wife, Elizabeth Ann Whitney, who had held those fast meetings in Kirtland, who had been a counselor in the Relief Society in Nauvoo, who continued to demonstrate the gift of singing in tongues to the end of her life, who was present in many ecstatic meetings where women blessed one another, spoke in tongues, testified, and, and demonstrated the gift of the Spirit. Women sometimes stepped in when men failed in their duties. One Sunday in that early months in the Salt Lake Valley, Levi and Rebecca Ryder tossed authority back and forth after Orson Pratt failed to f appear to give a sermon at one of these little meetings in the cabin. And as Patty explained it, Levi Ritter gave the meeting unto his wife. She called in a few sisters, had a good meeting. Some of the men stayed with us. Eliza added that Rebecca Ryder wished me to preside for her. <laughs> so it's Levi's house. He declines to preside. He hands it to his wife, and his wife said, Eliza, you know how to do this. You preside over this meeting. The following week, the sisters got together, and they dined at the Ryder cabin. And then they arose, and they blessed Rebecca as the mistress of the feast, giving her the courage, 
later in the afternoon to preside over the meeting held in her house. They began to call these meetings, jokingly, organized parties. <laughs> and the common term that goes way past this point for a meeting where women got together, prayed, blessed one another, and shared revelations in tongues was had a good time. It meant we felt the spirit of God in each other's company. We were able to carry on because we were huddling together. Now there's more to this story, but my time is up. And we can open this up for questions and discussion if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to have time. We're going to. Uh, Dr. Ulrich has graciously um, agreed to entertain questions and a little discussion time. Um, before we do that, however, we have a little presentation we would like to make. And to do that, I would like to um, invite Lindsay Combs Brewer up. Uh, she's a news media major, minoring in women's studies from Oakdale, California, and she is our Women's Studies Honor Society president. Okay. So. The Women's Studies Honor Society is a place for BYU students to find a sense of community and an opportunity for, for learning outside of the classroom for those interested in women's studies. So as president, I would like to first thank you for your work and your inspiration to LDS women and men and induct you as an official honorary BYU <laughs> Women's oh, Studies oh, Honor oh, Society yes. member <laughs> by presenting you this Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a couple of microphones and they will roam around so you can just um, stay where you're at and kind of raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Yeah. My question is for when Eliza R. Snow reorganized the Relief Society. She did so with direct appeals to Joseph Smith's authority and the, that kind of delegation earlier during the Nauvoo Relief Society. So did Brigham Young have a problem with Eliza R. Snow doing that? He seemed pretty firm on his earlier comments. I'm just wondering if there was conflict there too. Okay, that's a fabulous question. If I'd have had another hour, <laughs> we'd have gone there. I go all the way in the book. Um, so yes. Boy, he meant it. Uh, it's really two decades. I mean, let's think about this. It's banned in 45. It's formally reorganized, but not quite as formally in some ways as we might think in 67, 68. Eliza Snow in her memoir says, Brigham Young asked me, to help organize the Relief Societies because the bishops didn't really know the order of things. This, in my opinion, is one of the very few cases where Eliza actually takes credit for things she did. She, almost, she always kind of dissembled. But there was a brief revival of Relief Society in 1854, and it lasted about four for maybe five years, up to the Utah War. Um, and it was very important, and it's a really important moment that I talk about in detail in the book. But it came from individual initiative of women. They began to make clothing for the Paiute Indians. And they had been meeting for several months before Brigham Young said in a Sunday sermon, "Oh." Why don't the sisters get up Relief Societies to make clothing for the Paiute Indians? And um, they reorganized what had been a voluntary society under the authority of the ward bishops. And that flourished for a while. 
and then kind of dissipated, and I have a whole chapter about what I think happened. I'm not sure. But really, we didn't get Relief Society back on a firm foundation continuing to the present until 67, 68. And again, it was expedient because the women had been greatly engaged in household production during the Civil War. And Brigham Young was really trying to get a cooperative movement going. He was trying to rally the church against the coming of the railroad, the incursion of Gentiles. He was trying to keep the community together. He was not always having the best luck with the men. He really turned to the women because he needed them. He, he had an idea of women as busy beavers doing this economic work and supporting his agenda. What is very clear is Eliza and Sarah Kimball, who are the ringleaders here, they have another agenda. It's the minutes of the Nauvoo Relief Society who become the guide for Eliza's instructions to the women Relief Society, called as Relief Society presidents in various parts of the territory. And the first thing Sarah Kimball does is build a building. It's modeled after the Brick Red store in Nauvoo with a lower level for selling goods that the women had made in their cooperative society and in the upper level for meetings. And it is in that upper level where they organize the massive protest against the Cullum anti-polygamy bill and mount the indignation meeting as a kind of centerpiece of my book. They move into the women's rights movement, and they really do. In the follow-up meeting after, after uh, the indignation meeting, when they're saying what great press they got nationally, Sarah Kimball says, I'm ready to declare myself a woman's rights woman. And the others follow suit. So yes, Brigham needed them. He needed them in the 1850s to help um, build relationships among the Paiutes in particular, to hold them off from uh, rising. And he needed them in the 1860s. He knew he needed them. And it's not clear whether he ever had a full vision. In fact, <clears throat> Church Historical Office rewrote the minutes. Didn't have time to really <clears throat> do that, but greatly softening the promises in the meetings. But Eliza kept the minutes, and they've now been published, and you can see them. Um, they believed there was something more Joseph was offering them. We don't know what that was precisely. We can only guess on the basis of their behavior. So thank you for that question. That's an informed women's studies uh, minor, right? <laughs> Who's, who knows about the reorganization of the Relief Society. I'll try not to be so long in answering other questions. Do you believe people are still suspicious of women who huddle together? And, <laughs> and particularly uh, institutionally for us today, uh, do you have any advice for us, um, places to go and discuss issues? It's not particularly easy as women to discuss these issues in Relief Society. It's not necessarily a safe place to discuss certain issues. Um, and what can, what can you advise us to do as women? <laughs> I don't give advice. <laughs> Except um, I'll out my sister. I'll out my sister, who's a Relief Society president for the second or third time. Um, um, she discussed it in her Relief Society on the lesson she gave on the Sunday morning before March 17th. Why can't you discuss it in Relief Society? For heaven's sakes, it's church history. Let's discuss it. Let's learn from it. There's a lot to learn from this story, a lot to learn. And it's an uplifting story. It's a sad story. 
It's a really sad story. But it, it, it's also, I mean, people are working through horrible conflicts and confusion. And people got hurt. But uh, there's something about the resilience of um, these interesting women, including Emma. I mean, she eventually saw her son reorganize the church. Joseph Smith's teachings are being promulgated in the community of Christ. I mean, we should not weep at that. We should be happy that that happened. Um, and the church and the community of Christ are cooperating a lot on the research that helps us understand these, um, these stories. So I wonder if you could broaden the context a little bit for us with this posture of huddling together. Was this unique to Mormon women in the 19th century? Or if you look at you know, Catholic women in context, or the institution-building women in Protestant movements, or you like the spiritualist movement? Yes, it, you've already done it. Um, <laughs> uh, it was absolutely not unique. In fact, if you think of the congruence of the time frame, the um, early um, anti-slavery societies um, had, um, they varied. There were a, a varied um, stances on how to go about bringing the end of slavery in the United States. But in uh, one branch of the anti-slavery movement allowed men and women to participate together in their conventions. And when they went to England in 1842 for an international anti-slavery convention, the Brits were outraged that the idea that women could be delegates and sit and vote and speak, um, and because a lot of the American abolitionists were Quakers, where women had always spoken. Um, and they were forced to humble themselves and sit in the gallery and observe the proceedings. That was 1842. It's very, very close to what was happening here. In the 19th century, the idea of women, well, it took till 1920 to get the vote for women. That's what's so phenomenal that it happened in 1870 in Utah for complex reasons that we don't have time to discuss. So this is a, a pattern that's repeated over and over again. It's really hard to break those boundaries. And what's fascinating, I think, is how close people felt they were coming in 1842. Um, the, and so, you know, people in 42 said, when we get home, we're going to do something about this. Well, it took to 1848. 1850, the first women's rights conventions were organized to protest um, that kind of exclusion. But really, they lost big time in the Reconstruction Amendments after the Civil War. They had given up their cause to fully support the anti-slavery cause through the Civil War. They thought the payback would be they would enfranchise the newly freed slaves and women. And no way was that going to happen. And so the 14th Amendment to the Constitution is the first mention of the use of the word male anywhere in the Constitution. So the right of men to suffrage was fully ratified um, in that moment. So yes, this is absolutely parallel. There's nothing particular to Mormonism about it. And in fact, Mormons, we can argue, in many respects, were somewhat ahead um, in a number of issues, such as the ability to divorce, um, other than for a very narrow range of causes. So thank you for that question. I think we have time for two more. Do you think that's? Yeah. Okay. 
How do you personally reconcile your faith when you come across things in Mormon history that seem to kind of shift your testimony? How do you go back to the that? Um, I, things in history don't shape my testimony, and that's, that's maybe a generational thing. It may be because I am a historian, and history tends to help me understand things. Um, uh, it helps me see context. It helps me understand the way people are. Um, I certainly get upset when members of the church do dumb things, um, including leaders. I mean, I've had leaders who've done really dumb things. <laughs> upsetting, personally upsetting to me. Um, I think this is a human experience. And I like Eliza R. Snow's hymn where, think not when you gather to Zion that all of your troubles are over. <laughs> I mean, we, we live as human beings to, to work out. I've quoted this many times, but a, a bishop said, the church of Jesus Christ is not the place to come to find, to, it, it's, not, it's not true because it exemplifies the Christian virtues. It's true because it's a place where we learn how to exercise those Christian virtues. Um, so I know it's different for your generation. And I mourn that because I think you've been taught a form of history that was not true. Um, and if we really know and understand history and we understand what it can and cannot tell us, then it seems to me it's enlightening rather than threatening. I'd like to go back to those 85% um, of the 1300 Hulu Society sisters that chose to go west. Uh -huh. um, I'm wondering if perhaps another reason that they made that choice was not just um, wrapping their arms around polygamy and um, endorsing Brigham Young, but might it have also been motivated by economic reasons that they looked at their options and felt like they really didn't have any, but to be part of a, a polygamous household and... Oh, and this is a, yeah, thank you. This is a wonderful question, and I did not mean to imply that women went west because they embraced polygamy. I meant they went west and they got polygamy. <laughs> um, but those women did not go west for economic reasons. You do not flee your country and live in a refugee camp and see your babies die for economic reasons. The economic motivation is to go find your relatives in the east to stay in the Midwest, to renounce your faith, absolutely. That was the economic priority. Once you're out there in the West and established and have a family and have kids, and you might hate polygamy, and many did, but um, you make a choice. Human beings make choices with their options, and some left. The interesting thing is some left monogamous marriages to become polygamous. And I cannot explain that to you, um, except that monogamy was no piece of cake in the 19th century. It isn't today. <laughs> and it wasn't then. And there were very few rights that women had economically um, outside of a marriage, and marriage to a as they would say, a righteous man or a good man, for some women was more appealing than staying with a legal husband who wouldn't let them worship as they chose. So it was a choice among many options, and in no sense am I celebrating polygamy. That was tough. I wouldn't want to do it. Okay.